We are in a series right now we are calling uh, The Intimate Pursuit, and today is the conclusion uh, for that series. Uh, really, the, the point and the goal of the series is this, is that we would be a people who pursue the Lord in every single season of life. The history of the world and the history of mankind is a history of God pursuing his people for intimate relationship with them. And so I want to give you just a, a, a really quick uh, recap uh, this morning of our series. In, in week one, what we talked about was uh, how we do, we want to be a person who pursues the Lord in every single season of life, not just when we need him. Oftentimes what will happen is we'll learn to go to the secret place only when we need something from God, but what we need to be able to do is to go to the secret place in every single season, even when we don't need anything from God, simply because we just have this love for the Lord. How many of you just love Jesus? Come on. You just love the Lord. In week two, uh, we talked about how you steward your time in the secret place. You know, I'm convinced that for many people, they don't even know how to come before the Lord in the secret place and how to spend time with Him. And so we kind of laid out, I kind of gave you some pointers on how to spend time with the Lord in the secret place, that you spend time when you first wake up, whenever that might be, and, uh, and how you approach it with your heart and how you approach the Word. And so if you missed that message, I encourage you to go back and to listen to that. In week three, Pastor Mike spoke about the different ways in which we all connect with God. Because every single one of us in this room we are created differently. We all connect with God differently. And so he introduced those 12 different ways you connect with God. And uh, you can also take an assessment, if you have not done that, to discover how you personally connect with God. I thought it would be interesting to share with you uh, the, th the top three and the bottom three ways in which, you, uh, in which this church connects with God. I found it pretty interesting. Uh, the first and the, the top way is learning. You guys love reading the Word of God. That is really, really good news. I, I like that about this church. The top way you connect with God is learning. Uh, the second is adoration, is, is worship. I love that as well. You can encounter God through, through worship and through song. And the third way is remembrance, which is really great because we're going to be remembering uh, what Jesus has done for us on the cross by taking communion at the end of service. Uh, but the bottom three uh, are these. Uh, expression. Expression to be an artist. You like to draw or journal or connect with God in that way. Uh, the the uh, second to last way is fasting. <laughs> uh, we don't like to, to fast, and, uh, and I, I get it. Uh, fasting is not uh, all that great. Uh, it's not fun giving up food, but I have to tell you something. I, I don't like fasting, but I love the results of fasting. I really do personally, man, when I fast, I connect with God in this way. It's like I, if I fast for two, three days, within that period of time, man, I'm in a place where I feel so sensitive to the Lord. I, I can be talking about God and all of a sudden, I mean, I just, I, honestly, I just start crying. I, I cry like a little baby when I fast. Um, the, the, the last way, uh, the least way in which we connect with God uh, here as a, as a people of journey, uh, as far as the assessment's concerned, is, is through movement. <laughs> we, we, I guess we don't like working out, we don't like moving, we don't like walking. And so, uh, man, I just want to encourage you with this. Uh, we do need to make sure that we're healthy in, in spirit, soul, and body. But I really found those things really, really interesting. Uh, last week, uh, we talked about how... Uh, in order for us to walk in our spiritual authority, right, that it all comes from the secret place. That oftentimes we try to do spiritual warfare without actually having a relationship with the Lord, but spiritual warfare can only happen when we have this relationship with God. Because we try to do spiritual warfare and walk in the spiritual authority in which God has mandated for us to do for establishing his kingdom here on the earth, what ends up happening is we just feel burnt out and tired, and uh, I just encourage you, man, don't approach spiritual warfare without first going into the secret place. This morning, this is what I want to talk about. Uh, I want to talk about how we cannot reach our full potential 
unless we have relationship with others. It takes an intimate connection and a relationship with other people in order for us to walk in our full potential, really for us to make disciples. Uh, and so this morning I've entitled my message this, Growing Together in Pursuit. Growing together in this intimate pursuit after the Lord. Uh, if you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen, receive my notes this morning. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak today. God, we, uh, we come before you this morning. And we ask that, Father, the Lord, as we open your word today, that, God, you would speak to us. God, I, I do believe that many people in this room, they may be feeling lonely. They may be feeling in a place, in a season, like they don't have a connection with you or even other people. And Lord, today I believe that, God, you want to break down some walls. You want to remove some barriers that are holding us back from really truly having relationship that leads to authentic and real discipleship in which you've called us to walk in. Lord, I pray that today, God, that we would be a people who make disciples, God. Lord, for we're not disciples unless we make disciples, Lord Jesus. And so, God, we pray that, God, we would be those people, God. And so, Lord, we ask for you to speak. God, I ask for you to remove myself out of the way today. Give me clarity, Father God, in your word. And, Lord, may you just be seen and lifted up above everything else. We love you. We honor you. We bless you. And everyone said in this place today, come on, somebody. Amen, amen, amen. amen. You know, so oftentimes, I'll go to someone, and this is a, a, a typical question to ask when you see someone that you, you know, maybe an acquaintance, and you, you'll say, man, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? Um, what's happening? And inevitably, oftentimes, everyone answers this question this way. I'm fine, right? I'm fine. Everything's good. Sometimes, when someone says that to me, I'll look at them and I can tell by their body language and in the way in which they're saying it that really, honestly, they're not fine. They're not doing okay. There's something going on in their life where they are struggling. And so if I see that, I'll oftentimes pry a little bit. I'll say, man, I really don't feel like you're fine. What's going on? Like, how are you really really do it. And then from that place, they open up a little bit, and I have this opportunity then to pray for them and to minister to them. But don't we do this with our relationships? Oftentimes, we try to put on this front, this persona, this mask, this barrier. And really, why is this? Well, really two typical reasons is because we experience hurt from previous relationships. We'll dig into that a little bit more, but We've also are walking in this pride where we don't, we want to seem like we've got everything together. You know, relationships are so important. Um, in life, three of the most important relationships, decisions you'll make, and the first most important relationship you'll make is, will you have a relationship with Jesus, right? Will you choose to follow the Lord? That's first and foremost the most important relationship decision that you will make in your life. The second most important relationship decision that you'll make in your life is who are you going to marry? Who are you going to choose to spend the rest of your life with, right? I say this to, to, to young people who, who aren't married yet and are college age, especially when I was a college pastor back about 10 years ago. I would say, you know, you got to be selfish with who you choose to be selfless with. Right? You've got to make sure, man, that, that partner, that person you're spending the rest of your life with, you've got to be selfish with who you choose to be selfless with. In other words, you've got to make sure they are the right person for you. Because God is calling you, once you make the decision, to be selfless with them in your life. You're called to serve them and to be there for them and to love, love them to death do you part, right? The third most important relationship decision you'll make is where you're going to go to church. Where are you going to go to church? What kind of relationship are you going to have with the church? How are you going to dig in and serve and to give and be a part of the life of the church? These are 
important decisions that you will make. Relationships are important. Are important. Why? Because relationships inevitably will rub off on you and you'll be like the people in which you are around, right? And really, we're going to be discipled one way or the other. We're going to be discipled to be a disciple of Christ. We're going to be a disciple to be a disciple of the world. And ultimately, we've got to make sure that those relationships in which we are surrounding ourselves with are godly relationships. And we really have a value around here about discipleship. We put discipleship and say it like this. This is how we articulate it. We introduce this at the beginning of the year, a new value. We put it like this, discipleship, never stop. As disciples of Jesus, we will never stop growing in our relationship with him. We believe Jesus' best plan for this is discipleship. We will be disciples that what? Make disciples. Every single one of us in this room are called to make disciples. You're called to make disciples. In Genesis, at the very beginning of time, we see this important detail that happens right off from the start. That every living thing, every creature has a seed within it so that they might multiply because there is potential inside of every person to multiply. Look at this, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, it says this. Then God said... Let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing. Why? So that they won't just live, grow, and then die, but they will live, grow, and produce whatever is like them. Reading on. Let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing, plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to the various kinds. This literally means so they can make more of themselves. And it was so the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kind. And God saw that it was what? It was good. So God said, I'm going to create this system. I'm going to create these things, and then these things are going to have this seed within them, and then those things are going to multiply like themselves. They're going to produce the same thing within themselves Uh, that is exactly like them. And then God takes it a step further with man. He says, I'm going to place my seed within man, and I'm going to create them like my image, and then they're going to create others, right? So look at this. As God takes a step further in Genesis uh, verse 27, Genesis 1, 27, says this, so God created man in his own image. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Watch this next thing. It's it's incredibly important. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. This is your command. And when God is in the middle of something, what he's asking us to do is to be fruitful and to multiply. So the question is this. Why does this not happen on a discipleship level? Why does this not happen on a discipleship level? And I'd submit to you, this is the reason. Because we've messed up the area that is needed for multiplication. We've messed up the area that is needed for multiplication. It's not enough for creation just to have a seed. All creation has to connect. There has to be this intimate connection in order for multiplication to happen. God created a system. He created a way for multiplication. So this is what I want to do this morning. I want to give you two things that God requires in order for us to disciple, to bring multiplication, and to see fulfillment, and for us as a people to walk in the fulfillment and the potential and our destiny that God has placed on our lives. The first thing I want to give you is this. God requires intimacy in order for things to multiply. God requires intimacy in order for things to multiply. So God sets up this system. We see in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, we see the temptation, and then we see the fall. And then God says to Satan, I'm going to crush your head from the seed of Adam. And from that point, Satan has this agenda. And his agenda is this. His agenda is to stop 
intimacy so that you don't multiply. His agenda is to stop intimacy so you don't multiply. See, here's what's crazy. Sin is not there just because. Because if Satan can stop intimacy, he can stop multiplication. If he keeps you hurt, if he keeps you broken, if he keeps relationships around you uh, being in this distorted, non-healthy way, and you guard yourself from all things that are intimate, then he can keep you from discipleship, and he can keep you from multiplication. Doesn't this make sense as to why that we struggle with relationships, not only with God, but with other people as well? He wants to stop us from having these intimate connections. Think about this. Think about Satan's agenda when it comes to these three, three things. When it comes to pornography. Pornography is not only addictive and destructive for relationships, but even secular uh, psychologists will say this, that when someone is addicted to pornography, it holds them back from actually being intimate in the relationship that they have. Because they're addicted to the screen because they're used to being intimate with the screen versus intimate with the person that God has had in their life. And it destroys their ability to even be intimate in the bedroom. It's crazy. This is Satan's plan to stop multiplication. When you think about the homosexual agenda, the homosexual agenda is not a homosexual agenda at all. It is Satan's agenda to stop multiplication. It is. It's Satan's agenda to stop multiplication and to take intimacy out of relationships, true, authentic intimacy in which God has created us for. When you think about divorce, and, and I'm going to give some hope here in a moment, so just hang with me, okay? When you think, of, think about divorce, divorce, what it does is not only, it's not, it's the, the bad part of it is it's not the breaking of vows, but it's the potential in the, uh, of the kids and how it hurts the kids and the offspring. Look at, look at this in Malachi. It says this. It says this about divorce. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. You see, it was all about potential. It was all about multiplication, the offspring. So he says this. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your, your youth. The devil says if I can create divorce, you will never have kids, never have godly offspring. But even then, if you do, then those kids will be wounded, hurt, struggle with trust, and struggle with intimacy. You see, the devil, what he's after is he's after potential. You might be here right now, you might be saying, Adam, I'm in one of those categories, and uh, I'm struggling. Let me give you some hope right now. This is what the last Scripture in the Old Testament says, he says, he then, being Jesus, will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. You see, if the hearts of the parents and the kids, if multiplication factor of the seed is off or messed up, it will lead to destruction. It's all about relationships. But thankfully, let me give you some good news right now. What happens is Jesus comes in on the scene, and he comes for two reasons. Jesus comes to break the curse of sin. You see, Satan had an agenda with these things, but then Jesus comes in, and he comes with his own agenda. He comes in to break the curse of sin. So if you are in this room right now, and you say, Adam, I have been struggling with pornography, and I can't get set free, and yet it is affecting my relationships. What Jesus came to do is he came to set you free. No longer do you have to be bound by that any longer, but whom the Son sets free is free indeed, and you can walk away from that sin, you can walk away from that addiction, and that can be broken in your life. You might be saying, Adam, I struggle with homosexual tendencies, uh, and I want to tell you this right now, God can come in and he can fix those things in your life. He can make the crooked path straight. He can make those ways that, man, you're struggling with, and he can set things right. If you're in this room right now and say, man, Adam, I've walked through divorce and I've walked through the pain of that relationship, let me first off just say, man, I am sorry you've walked through that. I, I can't imagine. I'm sure that, man, that, that hurts deeply. But 
that does not have to define you. What happened to you does not have to define who you are because Jesus has paid the curse of sin. Not only does it have to, not have to define you, but it also doesn't have to define your kids. They don't have to walk around with this uh, inability to not be able to trust uh, with, with future relationships and walk around broken and hurt. I believe, man, and I, not only do I believe, but I know, I know that God can come in and bring healing inside of that pain and that hurt that even they've experienced. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to break the curse of sin. He also came for this. He came to send the Holy Spirit. And this is really, really beautiful, that the fact that the Holy Spirit was sent for us to live inside of us and to bring not only, um, not only uh, are we now, uh, does he bring correction and he brings guidance and he helps us, but the beautiful thing about it is it's almost as if God is putting his image back inside of us. Look at that. When Jesus came and he sent the Holy Spirit, he then is replanting the image of God back inside of his people, recovering what Satan's agenda was. You see, when the Holy Spirit came, it echoes Genesis chapter 1, when Jesus put his image inside of his people. Look at this in Matthew. Jesus says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, what? Go and make what? disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. The Greek word here for disciples is this word mateo. Now go, multiply again and again. Let the seed of the gospel then spread to the four corners of the earth. This is Jesus' plan for multiplication. You see, he's put a seed of promise inside of you to then go and to multiply, to make disciples that make disciples. Mateo, this Greek word, it means this. It means to disciple, helping someone to progressively learn the word of God, to become a matured, growing disciple to train in the truths of Scripture and the lifestyle required, helping a believer learn to be a disciple of Christ in belief and in practice. Listen, this is huge. We have no idea the effects that we have in really all of humanity when we take a simple step of discipling someone. We have no idea what they're going to con uh, accomplish. You see, there's potential inside of every single person. God has put a seed inside of you. He's put a calling inside of you, and there's potential for you to grow and to flourish. But here's the thing about it. We cannot do it without other people around us. We cannot do it when we are alone. And you have no idea who you're discipling what God has placed inside of them. Imagine the person who discipled Billy Graham, man. The amount of people that he brought to the Lord. You have no idea what you were doing when you were discipling someone else and the potential it has for the kingdom of God. You see, God has set up this system, this system of relationship. Not only this system of relationship uh, between us and him, but system of relationship between us and other people. God has given us a love letter, the word of God. This word of God is meant to build relationship with him. You see, God is a God of relationship. He's a God of, of family. He says this, I am the I am God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, God thinks about family. He thinks about multiplication. He thinks about expanding the family through the gospel that you bring, that he's placed inside of you to go out into all the world and to make disciples. So the first thing this morning, and God requires intimacy in order for things to multiply. The second thing is this, God requires transparency for relationships to be intimate. God requires transparency for relationships to be intimate. There is something about transparency, isn't there, when it comes to relationships? There's something about honesty when it comes to relationships. And really what's happened is since the, um, since the time in the garden, with humanity having free will, we have struggled with this, haven't we? We have struggled with this. We have been 
All of us have been trying to cover up the majority of our sins, our failures, our shortcomings. We've been trying to put on a mask and fig leaves because we don't want to be transparent. We've been trying to cover up. But here's the thing about the relationship with the Lord is this, that God does not require for us to be perfect. But what he does require from us is for us to be transparent. This is how this relationship with the Lord works. Even in our own time with the Lord, when we come before God, what do we come? We come with transparency before him. And this is really beautiful because, man, you, you feel like, man, some of you in this room, that when you come before God and you confess your sins, that maybe you're judged. But here's the thing about this relationship with the Lord is that you were not judged. This is what God does. He says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That as we build this relationship with the Lord and we can come before the God and have this, this transparency with him, that's what I love about the Psalms and David, this relationship that he had with God, is that when he came before the Lord, man, he was so transparent with where he was at. He's like, God, I am struggling right now. Lord, I don't understand this. Lord, I feel like you've left me. Like he is so transparent with the Lord. This is the type of relationship that you can have with God because, again, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. His grace and his mercy and his love for you, man, is more than enough. Who can know the height, the depth of his love? the width of his love. It is so, so great and so vast. And so you can have this transparent relationship with the Lord. And my encouragement with you is this, as you grow in that and you understand that you can come before God and be transparent with him, then that you would also find places and find people that then you can trust to also be transparent with. That you can remove the mask with someone in your life and just, man, say, I'm struggling with this. I'm going through this right now. Man, I, 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 this situation with my finances, the situation with my spouse, the situation, just how I'm feeling. Man, I'm feeling depressed and feeling anxiety and everything else. You can be open and transparent with someone because we all need that. Because if we're not being transparent with other people, what ends up happening is we walk through self-denial. We deny that that thing even exists and we bury it and we bury it deep down inside of us and we don't even want to approach it because it almost feels like it's too painful. But man, if you're able to come before someone, not only God, but other people and confess, man, I'm really dealing with this. When you get out in the open, man, it just feels so much better. And what ends up happening is this intimate connection begins to happen intimate connection with your spouse, intimate connection with someone maybe in your small group, your small group leader, whatever it might be. Like, we're not built to do life alone. We're not built to wear this mask and to put on this facade that we've got everything put together. In order for us to really, truly have intimacy with the Lord, we've got to have these intimate relationships also with other people. I wrote this down. If we are the only ones who knows our secrets, we are in trouble. If we're the only ones who knows our secrets, then we are in trouble. You gotta take off the mask, you gotta stop playing this facade because what's up happening, we build walls and create elaborate defense systems to appear the way we think we should be and hide the real person inside. But man, that really is a lonely place, isn't it? It kills the soul. One of the most destructive lies of the enemy is he whispers to our heart, that we must not let others see who we really are. Yes, but may we get to a place where we are able to open up and to be real with one another. Proverbs, it says this, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. Let that sink in for a moment. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy finds mercy. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Let that scripture right now just sink in. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
Listen, you can't fulfill your potential unless you have places where you can take the mask off and be real. If you keep your secrets, you will always be as messed up as your secrets. You need a place to get honest and real and find healing because God loves this honest, authentic transparency in our life. Man, this feels like right now, man, I don't, I, I, this feels right now, like in this room, man, Adam, this is a hard thing to do. I understand. I understand. It is difficult, but man, it is so freeing. I want this for you. It is so freeing when you actually really walk in this. Because this is really what it's all about. That's how the book of Acts and that early church did life together. They had this, they broke bread together, they communed together, they did life together, and they were open with one another. They shared all things. They had all things in common, Scripture says. And this led to this incredible move of God. If we really want to see disciples making disciples, man, we've got to take the mask off. We've got to be real with one another. And you will never fulfill the potential until you connect with others. Each of us contributes uniquely to the growth of the overall body of Christ. It says this in Ephesians 4.16. I'm invite the band forward. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Look at that again. Joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in what? Come on, someone. In what? Love. One more time. In what? Love. In love. We're there to support one another, to be there for one another. And man, every single one of us in this room, we've got faults, we've got sin, we've got things going on. But even when you find out, man, when people have a sin in their life, man, don't cast stones at them. Don't put them down. Man, we love, even in the body of Christ, to trample on people when we find out, man, they're struggling with something. Man, we got to do better, right? We can't gossip. We can't cast stones at other people because, man, take the plank out of your own eye. Take the plank out of your own eye. May we be a body of Christ that walks in the love of Christ. If we really want to be a safe place, a place to where we can really truly grow and make disciples, man, we can't gossip, we can't cast stones at other people, man, we've got to be a people who build one another up in love. Listen, some of you in this room, you're the hands, but without the arm and the connection to the arm, you can't fulfill your potential. You need someone else. Some of you in this room, you're the foot, right? But you, unless you have a leg to be connected with, you can't fulfill your destiny and your purpose and your potential. Listen to me in this room. My point is this, is that we are the body of Christ and we need each other to build disciples. We need each other to fulfill the destiny and the call that God has placed on this body and on this church. And it takes an intimate relationship in order to do so. And so I encourage you, man, get beyond just the surface stuff. And let's dig in. Let's dig into uh, this relationship that God is calling us into with one another and with him because we cannot have this intimate even relationship with him unless we have an intimate connection with other people in our lives. Amen? Amen. I said at the very beginning that really what holds us back from this is two things. The first thing is hurt, right? Hurt, hurt from previous relationships. When I think about this, the solution for this is forgiveness, Forgiveness a lot of times, though, is easier said than done, isn't it? It's hard. It takes work. But I want to say this. Forgiveness is not forgetting what happened, but it is allowing the Lord to come in and to allow you to forgive that person for what was done to you. Some of you in this room, man, you, some things have been done to you that are horrific, are hard, are difficult. You've experienced even in some ways church hurt. But you've got to come to a place where you forgive. The second way 
and which holds us back from authentic relationships and intimate relationships is really pride, isn't it? It's pride that we want to put up this facade that, man, we got everything together. And people post only the good stuff on social media. <laughs> Don't compare yourself to other people based off of social media. My two cents to you. It's unhealthy. It's not what God's called you to do. You can't fulfill your potential if you do that. I want to invite the ushers forward and uh, anyone who's serving communion this morning. We're going to take it together. And I think this is really fitting this morning to take communion because, you know, Jesus is the ultimate example of how he forgave. He was betrayed. He was sped upon. Man, he went through some stuff. But he said on the cross, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. Right? Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. You think about pride. Jesus, when you think about it, man, being the Son of God, being in that type of position, many of us in this room, every single one of us probably, we would be filled up with so much pride, being the Savior of the world. Can you imagine being, dealing with that? But Jesus, he was the ultimate example of humility and lack of pride. And so as we partake of communion today, that's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember what he did for us on the cross, the finished work on the cross. And man, if you've walked through those things even in your life with what I mentioned earlier, with divorce, pornography, homosexuality, any other sin, the finished work of the cross means that he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he broke the curse of sin. That's what's beautiful. So if you would, just bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray with you before I invite you forward to take communion. If there's anyone in this room that just says, man, Adam, I don't have a relationship with the Lord. I want to give my life to him this morning. I want to invite you to give your life to him this morning. If that is you, would you just raise your hand to the Lord? If you want to give your life to Jesus, would you raise your hand to him? Say, man, I want to give my life to him. Anyone at all? 